show the format of the PYB. So you've seen it, it's just concatenated code objects. Um, it looks pretty meaningless, but it means that we can collide, collide in like a, a, a neutral format. So now we'll do the same for the obfuscated PYBs. So gen obfuscated two six. And now rather than pointing at the standard libraries, um, the standard library modules, we're pointing at the obfuscated Python's library modules. So we'll generate the, the PYBs for all of those. Now, it looks like it failed, but that's just all the warnings, uh, the future's warnings. Uh, so I promise you, it didn't fail quite that bad. Uh, as proof, we've got all our uh, obfuscated PYBs here. So now we're going to collide them and remap. And so if we scroll, scroll up, so we're just like literally taking all of them and smacking them against each other. And we can see you know, for import name, it's gone from 107 to 108. The, the shift that I did in the obfuscated Python was just incrementing the numbers by one, but it could have been anything. Um, <clears throat> and so now it says do we want to write out our new uh, opcode.py, which we do. And so if we look in the libs, we'll see you know a new opcode.py has been generated. Uh, it's a remap by Pyretic, blah, 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 blah. And the same for opcodes.py, which is uh, essentially the same kind of file, but for uh, the unpyc uh, decompiler. So we've collided both streams, remapped them, regenerated our opcode.py, and now we're in a position that we can use a lot of the standard tools because we've undone their, we've re-remapped their opcode remapping. Um, so we'll jump back into the demo, and I'll show you the decompilation later. That wasn't what I meant to do. That's better. So. Um, we talked about the obfuscations, and we talked about how we got around them at the Python layer. Um, now we're talking about why do we want to decompile in memory rather than statically off disk. Um, so we use um, like in-memory decompilation uh, for all the reasons that we said, uh, because often you won't be able to actually access the files on disk, either because they're sitting on a different system somewhere or because the, the, all the obfuscation attempts have been placed onto the, uh, around the actual data on the disk rather than the data in memory. Um, all, stand, all the standard Python decompilers require access to the code, to the, to the, to the file objects. Um, and uh, I mentioned earlier that module objects don't have a code object, which is a bit of a pain. So it means that we have to do, uh, we can't do pure decompilation, we have to do reconstruction, which is kind of inferring the source code rather than taking a code object and decompiling it back out through its assembly instructions. We have to pro poke and prod at objects and make best guesses about what they actually look like. Um, so that's more reconstruction than uh, actual disassembly, uh, sorry, uh, decompilation. And this is from the Python documentation. You know, a module object does not have a code. It's for, it's for performance reasons, and it makes life far more difficult than it needs to be. Um, so once an object is imported uh, into a run in Python, um, a module can't be decompiled at the module layer because there's no object who can decompile. So we have to do the reconstruction. Um, it's kind of like runtime analysis. We prod and poke. We ask a lot of questions about the object. We, do, we use a lot of the underlying uh, double underscore attributes to try and work out more about the object. Um, and then we can have a fairly good guess, not perfect, and there's some catch, catch 10? Wow. <laughs> um, so this kind of, uh, we can pull together, uh, di different parts of this source code will come from different areas. Um, the stuff within test.func uh, will that can actually come from the uh, co.code object because it has one. However, the imports and the foo equals nine, the bar, all the attribute assignments can't come from a code object because there's no code object for it to come from. Um, so we have to do uh, a lot of dancing around and, and reconstruct it. There are some things that we can never be able to reconstruct. Um, as we can see, there's like an, foo has an initial value of nine, uh, but then foo is changed to 10. At runtime, we're never gonna know that that was initially nine. Uh, we can only get its current state. Um, calls to functions, uh, like bar, uh, we won't see that bar called test func 3, we'll see that bar test func 3 returned value whatever. So we get the returns from functions, but again, this is all at the top, top layer, and most people don't program the functions at the top layer. So um, it's, it's not perfect, 
but for when you're looking for bugs, it's good enough. And that's often what you need. You know, you're looking for areas of, of code which are going to be good for bugs, and it's good enough. So the Pyretic Toolkit. Um, it's pure Python, obviously. Um, and it just came from my need to wanting to not do custom reversing on every single Python application. Um, so it came from laziness. The so three main areas, decompilation and reconstruction uses uh, unpyc, but it's extended. It's made a lot more um, uh, error tolerant. A lot of decompilers are very brittle. As soon as there's any deviance in the standard bytecode, they'll fall over. Uh, so unpyc has been made a lot more robust. Uh, all the patches that I've written for unpyc are going to go back to the guy who wrote it, some Russian guy. Um, and uh, there's three different types of decompilation which we can show. Uh, so decompilation in Pyretic is both a traversal, how you get from one object to the next, as well as how you then decompile that object. So, um, and depending, depending what constraints and what obfuscations are in place depend on what is the right technique to use. Um, so we can walk the file system, get access to the module object. If we have access to an unmar uh, if we have access to unmarshal, uh, if they haven't removed that, then we can just demarshal that module object and decompile it. Um, best case scenario, we'll get high quality source code uh, out of it, but we have to have access to the unmarshal. If we don't have access to the unmarshal, um, then we can walk the file system and do the object decompilation, uh, the in-memory decompilation, and the source reconstruction that we spoke of. Um, again, we'll lose some of those top layer objects, um, but it's still pretty good, and we'll see, we'll see the compare and contrast to, to them. Um, and if we don't have access to any of the files, so we can't traverse a file system saying, there's this file and that file and that file and that file, we can take an object from memory and then look at all the other objects which it's related to and then do the in-memory decompilation on them. So the, uh, you don't need access to files on disk, but the, you will only be able to decompile things that are instantiated into memory within the current state. So there's pros and cons to each technique. Uh, it depends what obfuscations are in place, uh, but all are available in Pyretic. Um, well, it's flown off the side. Um, there is, uh, can I shift? Uh, the opcode remap, which we've seen, obviously it makes the process of colliding these, uh, these uh, uh, streams of PYBs a lot easier, uh, puts it into a few commands. And there's uh, repdb, which is uh, a superclassed PDB that gives you access to a lot more reverse engineering functionality. Um, obviously, it was what I was using before to do the opcode remapping. Um, also, I had like, a lot of stuff that I put in for laziness allows calling out to uh, create call graphs, et cetera. So from the runtime, you can see how all the objects are relating to each other in a call graph sense, which can give you a good way of overviewing a project and where to start focusing um, and putting more time. Uh, so there's some future directions. There's loads of work still to be done. Um, you know, Obviously, having it in a, in a GUI would be nice. Um, UmpyC is good. Um, I'm not knocking the guy who wrote it, but this, it's certainly not perfect. It doesn't implement everything. Um, uh, it would be nice to have some kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of vis visualized call graph of seeing all the blocks, double click on a block, and you can get to the, uh, to the source code. Um, and obviously, it's going to be made into an online service, so you can all send me your bugs. Um, so before we hit the conclusions, we'll do, I'll show you the, the remapping, conclude, and then we can get out of here. So we've, uh, done, we've done the remapping. Let's do the geek decompilation on, on the files. Uh, I'll show you all three types of decompilation, and we can compare the uh, the code which is produced and see you know, kind of where it sucks in places and doesn't in others. So this is the first type. Uh, if you've got access to an unmarshalling uh, command, you can take the objects from from uh, and just unmarshal them out and decompile them um, after obviously the remapping has has taken place. So this is the test app uh, that I spoke of. So if we just decompile that, it's all very quick. Uh, this goes into the source code and some ridiculously long path. Yay. All right. So we can see um, this is you know, this is a good quality decompile. It's got the imports, it's got the top level object, it's got the, the function calls. This is because we decompiled from an unmarshaled object. So this is, I mean, this is, this is good, um, but only if we've got the, the unmarshaled object, uh, the unmarshaled capability. Um, 
If we haven't, then we can do the memory decompile. Go all the way back and then all the way back out again. And you'll see the areas where the, the, at the top layer where reconstructions had to be used rather than proper decompilation, you'll see some changes. Um, so you can see this kind of you know, this long, strange uh, class uh, there, uh, rather than it just being a test class. Um, obviously, the ordering uh, D, uh, we only that was the call to the to the function. Uh, we only get the return of, of its value rather than it being a function. But you know, it's good enough. You can understand the logic of what's going on. And then, if we didn't have access to uh, any files on disk and wanted to do everything in memory, we can do the same thing. Oh. Uh, rather than obviously applying it to a path, we have to apply it to, a, uh, to an actual object. So if we import the test app, you can see it's, it's in the, uh, the namespace here. So now if we just point the, this object uh, into the pure memd compile, This time we don't have such a long path to go along. You see it's named a bit funny because that's how it comes out in the namespace. Um, but you, we still get a fairly decent decompiler, and that's purely from, from the object. So we haven't touched disk at all. This is just from something that was available in runtime, and we've got a pretty good, good enough to find bugs with decompilation. Um, that's about as exciting. I haven't got any time to show like the core graphing or the calling out to the extra functionality. So conclusions, obviously the development and distribution landscape are changing. Um, we need to evolve uh, to make sure that our work and reversing and finding bugs it maintains a decent ROI, that we don't have to spend a year looking at something before we can get a good bug. Higher level languages actually give you a very rapid return on investment just because it's an area that not much, many people have looked into. There are Python reverse engineering techniques. We've had a little bit of a taxonom taxonomy across them. Um, uh, if we, as a, as a general rule, go from a static decompilation into a memory, we get some good advantages, some drawbacks, but I think those drawbacks are outweighed by the advantages that we get. And Pyretic uh, is kind of proof of concept for people to begin playing around with the memory decompilation stuff um, rather than like, you know, a commercial tool. You know, kind of take it and have a play with it. So with that, are there any questions? What kind of oh, uh, you and then you. So taking it into a tax live. Yeah, like uh, you get in there, play with it live, or just pull it down for the compilation. I mean, at the moment, um, it's purely been based on grabbing the source code, analyze offline, and then attack afterwards. Um, obviously, there's getting in process to a Python, you know, a Python service, and then doing like cool things like swapping out uh, code objects for other code objects. They're supposed to be immutable, but if the code object doesn't get refreshed, um, you, there, there are ways to swap it out. So you could uh, essentially Trojan in memory the Python objects. It would look good on disk. Um, all of those are interesting areas, not really what Pyretic's looking at, but certainly areas that I'm looking at. Um, so I'll speak to about next year. <laughs> and the guy. Uh, at the end of the first half of the demo, there was a thing in big capital letters that said opcode remap mismatch. What caused that? Um, the opcode remap mismatch is when uh, my py if the bytecode produced in the pybs doesn't quite match up so um, obviously i've just got some simple logic saying you know, read a byte you know is the byte the same or different um, is the value of that byte one that looks like it should have arguments yes or no um, so it's uh, you would have seen it said uh, like you know 100 opcodes remapped so it's like 13 opcodes missing um, that will be that could be because the um, the opcode uh, the, the bytecode that we generated those opcodes weren't actually generated within that bytecode stream. Um, but it's a good question. It's, it's something that I'm working on that wasn't ready for today is rather than going over the standard libraries like we were and colliding them, just having one Python file that uh, generates all of the known opcodes. So you just uh, compile that in the obfuscated compile it in the regular, and then you'll get every opcode, so you get 100% completion every time. Um, uh, that's something you shouldn't be too hard. I just haven't had time to, 
to do it, but that's where it will be.